Good afternoon and welcome to session 6A of the Cryptologic History Symposium, Longstanding Ciphers, New Cryptanalysis. We will be hearing today from Dr. Richard Bean, Dr. George Lazary, and Mr. Bob Bogart. Full bios and abstracts of their presentations are available in the attendee packet you received with the final program. Questions may be submitted anytime during the presentations through the Q&A box. When typing, please indicate the speaker to which you would like to address your question. Submitted questions will be gathered and relayed to the speakers by the moderator at the end of the session. So with that, Dr. Lazary and Dr. Bean, over to you. Hello, good morning. Uh, is it possible to start the slides? Thank you. So uh, I want to talk today about a, pro a project that uh, basically is a joint project. It will be as a team between myself, uh, Dr. Bean, who is also present here, and also Fraud Driver from Norway, who is not present. Uh, and it's about uh, intercepting and decoding messages sent from Biafra, and we'll give a few more details about what Biafra was about, and Lisbon in Telex in the late uh, 60s. Next slide, please. So I start with a very short overview, and the first part will be about inter the interception of the messages and their code breaking. And uh, then later on, Dr. Bean will present the contents of the uh, of the messages, of the decoded messages, and some historical context. Next, please. So the team has, uh, Dr. Bean is a mathematician and computer scientist from the University of Queensland, and uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's an expert on combinatorics and statistics, which are very important for code breaking. I am part of the Decrypt project. Uh, I will talk about Decrypt project in my, in my next presentation, and the one after that, the next one after, the, after this one. And uh, I'm also a computer scientist, and I'm also working on deciphering historical ciphers, and Prod Virat is a very well-known expert on historical machines and ciphers from Norway. Next, please. Uh, talk, I want to start with the interception and the code breaking. So uh, in, the, in, in the late uh, 60s, in 1969, uh, Ford Wyrod was a student uh, in the University of Oslo studying engineering, and he was also a radio amateur. And he found a way, uh, he was building his own uh, kit for radio amateur, and he found a way actually to connect uh, to his radio amateur equipment some telex or teleprinter uh, uh, devices, and with that, he was able to to uh, to capture some interesting uh, communication. Some of them were coded, some of them were just plain uh, plain text, and some of them caught his eyes. And uh, after a while, he reached a conclusion. Please, next slide, please. That uh, he reached a conclusion that those are coming from 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 the Republic of Biafra uh, in uh, in uh, in Africa, in, in uh, today Nigeria. A, and they were sent to Lisbon in Portugal. And uh, basically, uh, and uh, uh, Richard will talk about that a little more in detail, but basically there was a war at the time between 67 and 70. Uh, one of the region of, Biaf of uh, Nigeria uh, uh, split itself from, from Nigeria and the war started. And that at some stage that, that uh, the Secessionist Republic was encircled and this only way to communicate with the exile world was actually with telex messages and uh, a fraud, uh, this very young student and audio amateur was very lucky to capture some of that uh, communication. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the messages were in uh, plain text and that also helped him to understand what they're about. So here is a, it's about uh, some visit uh, in Kampala by the Pope and, uh, and the context uh, makes it clear that it's about the Afghan, it, it's about uh, politics. A, but that, those were the, the plain text one. Uh, next, next slide, please. And then he started to get some enciphered one, which were more interesting, but uh, it, it, well, it was in code, so it was not readable. And he started uh, first to analyze the structure. So there is a kind of preamble that comes again in its messages and, and, uh, and some numbers and something that uh, some, some, co some call sign uh, indication who is the sender, who is the receiver, and inside uh, the messages are, are, in five, uh, are, in, are in groups of five letters, and uh, there are some numbers inside uh, which were not clear what they mean at the beginning. But basically, this is the way they looked, and they started to accumulate uh, more and more of those uh, messages. Next slide, please. 
He also uh, captured a couple of them uh, in uh, digits, in five digit groups, uh, which look similar, but the, instead of, le of letters, those are digits. Next slide, please. So the first thing uh, he did is to make a list and uh, to look at the call sign and to see if something could be understood from the call, from the call sign. Uh, not too much at this stage could be, but the next thing he did, as uh, usually you would do in the, uh, for, uh, for uh, cryptanalysis, was to do some statistical analysis. And, uh, and next slide, please. And then uh, looking at uh, at the frequency of the letters and looking at those at the various messages, it turned out that E was the most frequent letter of most of the messages, and the order of the most of the top ten uh, uh, let, uh, letters were actually very similar on to what you would expect from an English uh, text. So this really is a, it's a strong indication that uh, this might be a transposition cipher with uh, English uh, being encoded. Next slide, please. Uh, the most free, the, the, the most uh, common way to uh, to use the, the transposition is called columnar transposition. You put the text in lines and then you you cut it into columns. Then you you shuffle the columns and then you read it again. And this is just an example when the if the, the rectangle is 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 full and you have a, the the number of letters in each line is the same, but you have more complex one. Next slide, please, which we call incomplete columnar transposition. In which some of the some of the columns are not complete, and then it's a little bit uh, more complicated to to break them. And uh, that the first attempt was to uh, actually fraud. Uh, after trying to solve them in the beginning, he didn't succeed in the in the 60s, so he decided to put them in a drawer. He did contact a few folks to ask about them, and it was not he was not sure what to do with it. But but about two years ago, three years ago, he published them. Uh, as published challenges for, for anyone to, to go and try to break them. And that's where uh, Richard and myself joined. And basically we continued that uh, collaborating uh, uh, work as a team. So um, next slide, please. So basically when we want to break columnar transposition, there are various methods. Some of them is one, is one of the papers that I published in the past. Uh, we use something that we call hill climbing. Basically we, we are starting some keys and we give them some rating, some rates. And then we are trying to get a better rate or better score for each uh, of the solution. And typically it, it, it works well even for very long keys, but for that specific example, it didn't work. And then after a while, one of us uh, tried uh, to look at the message themselves and to see if we can have some other entry point. Next, please. And then we just realized that are looking at two messages, there were a lot of similarities in the messages. You can see that some of the letters that are in bold actually are the same at the same position. And even the BICTR in the both messages are exactly the same position. So typically, uh, uh, so that those are for familiar with transposition cipher, it means that either the beginning or the end of the message is the same. So basically that uh, uh, the next things were try to, to do something and to solve them maybe together. Then next slide, please. And then by combining them, uh, we were able to obtain dark text, which is more or less readable. Some stuff is, is less readable. For example, you have uh, a lot of repeated D like E, D, D, D. And then we have two columns that we see that are really nonsense. They are not supposed to be there. We didn't know why at the beginning, but it was, it was interesting to see that this is some kind of transposition cipher. This is more or less a columnar transposition cipher, but not exactly. But then we try to do that on other type, on other messages, and we we failed all the time. And at this stage, we were quite desperate, and we started to look for even more drastic measures. Next slide, please. And uh, we look uh, for probable words. We look at uh, techniques like multiple anagramming, uh, ch checking uh, multiple type, multiple lengths of of the key, and then we started to go crazy. Like let's let's try very long key, which are not really realistic. No one used those key, those those lengths in the in the, in the history, but maybe that could help. So uh, we tested keys between 440 to 100. And next next slide, please. And very fortunately, uh, with one of them, with key 61, why 61? We had no idea at the time, but we started to we we, we got an, an, with another message. We got some words that actually didn't make some sense. If we look, if you it, there are some garbles. It's not they are not clearly uh, readable, but still, it's a good sign that that we are on the right track. 
So we, we wanted to understand what's going on here. What is the structure? Something is missed. It's not exactly corneal transposition, but it's very close. So what, what, what it's about? Next slide, please. And we also saw that if we look at the transposition key with 61 elements, actually uh, it does some patterns. For example, you have, uh, for, you have if you look on, in, on the right part, then you have some stuff which is at the distance of two. Uh, if we look at the, at, at, at the key uh, with uh, assuming a shorter length. So something is something is very interesting here. It's not it does it's not a real 61 length. Next slide, please. So we resorted to all the uh, proven uh, methods, which are uh, scissors and papers and pen, and we just cut the messages into strips and we started to reorganize those strips. And at the end of the day, we were able to put them in a way that we can read text in a readable way. Uh, next slide, please. And we did that with other messages, and we found out that we were able to uh, to read them uh, and then move them around with uh, strips and to read all of them. It, it, we didn't know yet what is the what, what the structure of the transposition is, but it was a good sign that we're on the right direction. Next slide, please. So uh, the next the next thing using those reassemble reassembling uh, reassembling exercise we wanted to try to understand how it is built so it took a while and after a while we were able to reconstruct uh, the exact scheme the exact way that someone encoding a message with that transposition would use and uh, then and at this stage we were able to uh, to uh, to, re to recover more and more messages next slide please and uh, after after a while, there, there are many 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 cases. All of them are mentioned in the in the in our paper in Cryptologia. Uh, we were able also to uh, to have a look at the indicator system. Indicator is part of the of uh, some some letters that are not part of the message them itself, but are, are, this this is a clue to what key or what type of key is being used. And we there was we did some exercise to analyze those uh, those indicators, and we found that uh, basically. The um, a transposition key in general could, can be generated by keywords, and there, is, there are some rules how to do that. And what we found that basically there is a base keyword, which is mat, so, ne, bar, star, q, w, something very strange like that. And the four last <coughs> letters of the, of the keyword, they are part of the message, so you just take them from the message, you, you uh, glue them uh, at the end of that base keyword, and then we, you create a transposition as a key based on that, and then you get a key which has a length of 21 and not the 61 as we thought at the beginning. So we were able also to break this, uh, the indicator system. Next slide, please. At some stage, uh, Freud uh, via his contact uh, contacted a, a few folks, and one of them is an author, an ex FRA, FRA is the, is the Swedish NSA. Uh, a, that wrote a book on Cold War, uh, Cold World cryptography in Sweden, and uh, he was. He, 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 we found out that in Sweden they also work on that problem. They also captured uh, those messages and worked on them, and uh, he was able to find in uh, the archive three messages that were kept. All of all the rest were destroyed, and then he sent this, he sent it them to us, and we worked on them, and we found out that there's a that <coughs> There was slightly a slight variation of uh, of uh, that uh, transposition uh, a, a scheme, but uh, I eventually were able to solve them. And, and actually, we found out that there were earlier messages and not later messages. Next, please. Uh, now I want to hand it over to uh, to Richard and we'll talk about the contents and the historical context. Okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. So um, I think um, there's an age difference. Uh, um, most people over 60 have heard of Biafra, but people under 60 uh, may not have. Um, so Biafra was either a secessionist state um, from 1967 to 1970. Um, they wanted to split off from um, the rest of Nigeria and or it's um, part of modern day Nigeria, the eastern region. So um, when we were looking at the um, these ciphers when they were written uh, the population was only about a quarter of what it is now um, it's a very young population and uh, it's much more urbanized so there's these mega cities like uh, lagos so there's 
uh, more than half the population is urban now and uh, the population density is very high, over 200 people per square kilometre. And uh, down in the bottom corner, you have the, the Biafran flag, um, reds the um, blood of people massacred in Nigeria, blacks mourning them, greens the prosperous future and half of a yellow suns um, with the 11 rays is the 11 provinces of Biafra. So next slide, please. Um, so a very quick history lesson, um, as George has said, um, from July 1967 to January 1970, uh, Biafra attempted to secede from uh, Nigeria and um, the borders of Nigeria had been decided in uh, 1885 uh, at the Berlin Conference um, by imperial powers. So Africa was divided up into that coloured map you see there. But in 1960, um, eventually Nigeria gained independence from the UK. Um, there was a coup d'etat in 1966, mainly by uh, officers of the Igbo ethnic group, uh, which was followed by um, pogroms um, against the Igbo people in uh, Nigeria, where many thousands of people were killed. So as a result of that, um, the next year, Colonel Ojukwu um, proclaimed the uh, Republic of Biafra, and that began uh, the Nigerial, Nigerian civil war for the next two and a half years. And uh, during that war, um, between half a million and a million uh, Nigerians died uh, mainly from starvation. So that's the context of these messages. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned um, Half of a Yellow Sun, uh, which was made into a film uh, written in 2006, uh, prize winning book. Um, and there's uh, also There Was a Country, uh, written in 2012, um, Memoirs of the, the War After 40 Years. And there are lots more famous books I could talk about, but um, the one that was most useful for us was written uh, just the year after the war um, in 1971 called uh, Behind the Rising Sun. So you've got this uh, theme of the sun a lot here. Next slide, please. So uh, some textual quotes um, will provide you the context of what the ciphers is, uh, ciphers are. So the book uh, Behind the Rising Sun is split into two parts. Um, so the first half is set in, uh, in Paris where the diplomats uh, of Biafra are trying to get support for the uh, breakaway country. So they're trying to do arms deals. Um, they're getting ripped off by unscrupulous arms dealers. Um, they're trying to get diplomatic recognition from, from Biafra. They could only get recognition from a few countries. But um, the second half is in is back in Biafra. But what we see is that um, it's basically a, a true story, but only the, the names are changed to fictional names. So in this part, they're in one of the most expensive hotels in Paris, um, the Hotel Lutetia, and they get a, um, a talix on, on the machine um, from Biafra via Lisbon in Portugal. And you can see things like um, most immediate top priority um, and repeat uh, comma is spelt out there. Uh, begin quote and stop and things like that. So, um, and at the at the bottom it said the message came in code. So, um, it, there's also a, a transposition layer applied. So um, that um, what we see in um, in the the book quote here is very much like um, what we were able to uh, decipher in the messages. Next slide, please. And uh, there's a brief description of what the Biafran embassy in, in Lisbon looked like. Um, so there was a room in the um, in the, the embassy at Lisbon, and uh, the only link between um, Biafra and the outside world was this one telex machine that moved around um, the cities in Biafra, depending on uh, what area they controlled at the time. So uh, Frederick Forsyth, for example, when he was in Biafra, the only way uh, he could uh, communicate to and from uh, the outside world was that. So he was um, on good terms with the rulers so he could do that. But um, yeah, there was no um, telephone or fax machine link or, or anything like that. So this was the only way in and out to get the messages and the news in and out. Next slide, please. 
Um, there's another book called Toads of War by Eddie Iroh. It's another example of a, um, a, a brief telex message here. Um, so you've got an order for three dozen sacks of salt arriving tonight, flight, stop. So there's the, um, the punctuation is spelled out again. Uh, and you makes you wonder, um, is salt really salt or a code word for something else? Um, but indeed it was. So even the most basic of commodities was um, had to be uh, shipped in and out um, because there was a blockade from uh, Nigeria of food and all sorts of other things. Next, please. We've mentioned um, the FRA, the Swedish Intelligence um, Organization or Signals Intelligence Organization, and that's um, extra context. Um, as George said, a uh, transposition specialist had um, worked on the ciphers, so that was another indication that we were dealing with transposition. Um, in this book, um, which is written in Swedish, there's uh, a list of code words and names, which we'll look at briefly here. Um, and just a, a quick summary of, of messages from um, 1968, um, sorry, 1967 to uh, 1970. Um, and some of them overlapped with the period where we're looking at, so August 1969 mainly. Next slide. Um, five minutes. Yep. Um, so, okay. Uh, the CIA was also listening in. The Foreign Broadcast Information Service um, picked up that there was radio traffic between Biafra and Lisbon. Um, and uh, so they wanted to know what uh, headline to put on it. Next slide. So here's an example of a Foreign Broadcast Information Service uh, daily report. Uh, it mentions one of the, uh, the characters, uh, Christopher Majekwu, who we see in the slides. Um, next slide, please. As a raw output, here's what one of the messages looks like. Um, as you can see, uh, highlighted in blue, we have 652. All of the numbers are spelled out. It's just uh, 20 columns. There's no spaces. Uh, the dash is spelled out. The punctuation, uh, HY, the initials are repeated. Um, it's a mystery as to who that is. Next slide. One of the example messages here, we have um, a message from Lisbon. Um, that's this spelled out from the previous message, uh, made more readable for Ogwumba and O, that's the leader, Ojukwu, um, from someone in Europe. Uh, a, a plane, a super constellation with registration number 86525, left this morning uh, from Lisbon with ammunition. You can see the, the plane pictured there. And then there's a code word uh, for aircraft itself, uh, Anomisa, um, is arriving tonight um, uh, from, for Onubugu. Next slide, please. Um, another example message uh, from Kogbara, um, uh, an Irish priest uh, who's organizing uh, relief supplies, Raymond Kennedy from Africa Concern. Um, wants to enter Flandon. So you see a code word for Biafra, uh, both the word Flandon and Delfon are used there, and the plane O-O-G-E-R um, is coming from Belgium, and they want to get to the current capital of um, of Biafra, that's Uli. And uh, they are just organizing our uh, salt flights. So salt is an essential substance that has to be flown in. Next slide. Yes. One of the... Um, messages which paints the diplomats in a less than flattering light is that um, some of them are skipping out on paying their hotel bills. Um, so Ajokwu um, is warned by one of the German diplomats that they have to be uh, supplied with enough hard cash to meet their needs. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, that in that book Behind the Rising Sun, uh, pseudonyms are used, not people's real names, because the story isn't always flattering and glorious. Next slide. Here's a list of all the code words that we used. I mentioned Dalphon and Flandon are code words for um, for Biafra, and there's a list of all the, the people's names there. So Ogwumba, uh, Chris, Chiji, you can get more details um, in our paper about who these people are, but uh, we'll look at some of them on the next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, 
we'll put faces to some of these names. Um, Austin uh, was a uh, diplomat before the Biafran War. Um, he's now 98. Some of these people are quite advanced age now. Um, and uh, he also worked as a, a diplomat during uh, the Biafran War, as did uh, all these other people. Um, and so Arthur Mebenefo after, afterwards became uh, the Nigerian representative to the UN. Um, so it would be great to get in touch with some of these people. Next slide. So the lessons for, from this work are that um, transposition ciphers are generally very easy to identify, um, as, as George had said, because of the frequency counts of the letters. But if you don't have much ciphertext, or you don't have many messages, and you're using non-standard methods like we did here, uh, then solving point be can be quite difficult. You need a, a lot of luck as well as uh, effort. But fortunately, um, modern computers can help. So building up frequency tables from uh, English text, uh, like Project Gutenberg is a great source. Um, Bus networks to download that sort of data. Um, and um, also uh, access to um, these books, which are kind of difficult to get hold of. Next slide. Uh, collaboration obviously helps um, somebody to explain the uh, technical aspects of uh, telexes uh, like uh, Frode, an expert in that. Uh, I didn't really have much of an idea what a telex was before this project began. Uh, stereotyped beginnings and endings of messages like message begins, message ends, repeats, um, they really help the analyst, especially because we see both the, the preamble in plain text and repeated at the beginning of the enciphered message. But um, to get further understanding, we really have to talk to um, the people from Nigeria. And uh, we haven't been able to make any progress on the, the five figure codes um, in the paper. So um, we see some repeated patterns, but um, we don't have any idea what, uh, what methods we used there. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, that concludes the uh, presentation and for more information you can go to the crypto seller of Frode uh, and look at all the uh, raw intercepts, um, the uh, the um, nicely formatted um, deciphered messages and for lots of detail we have a 68 page paper uh, there in Cryptologia and you can email us on uh, these messages, um, these uh, addresses if you have any further questions or just ask them after the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to Mr. Bob Bogart. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for coming. Uh, could we have the first slide, please? Switch slide decks there. Here we go. Um, this is a project that landed in my lap the very last year that I worked at NSA. And I'm so glad it did because it was so much fun to work on. Uh, a gentleman named Paul Kronmeyer, who works at NSA but not in the cryptanalysis section, approached NSA with, uh, approached the uh, cryptanalysis head with uh, some ciphered messages that he had uh, gotten from diaries that belonged to his brother's girlfriend's great great grandfather. So <laughs> these, uh, he had photocopied the 20 some entries from these, uh, these uh, diaries that he had, and then they were from 1905 through 1907. And the family had no idea what they had said. So for over a century, these ciphers had gone unsolved. Um, so, so uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this Charles Hafer is an, a gentleman who, who uh, wrote the ciphers, and he wrote them into little books like this. Uh, if you see on the, on the left side there, there's the diary from 1905 and 1906. 1907's entries are in the diary that are on the right. If we go to the next slide. You can see what uh, some of the entries looked like. It was entirely written in script. Now, I know that some people here won't be able to read script, but that's OK. I'll put up the translations for you. So each entry that he had in each of these diaries began with the day's weather conditions. So May, May 27th, Saturday, alternately clear and cloudy with prospects for rain, warm, did no work except help George Spangler in his shop in the evening. So weather conditions and then sometimes stuff that he did during that day. Go to the next slide, please. But some of the passages, like this one from May 1st, 1905, 
Uh, it starts off mainly clear and cool air, did no work, and then it breaks into this cipher. And you see cipher letters written in script that uh, you never see written together in regular English, but yet he's able to connect all these cipher letters. Uh, it appears that there are spaces separating words, but we weren't sure at the beginning. And of the uh, photocopies that were brought to me by Paul Kronmeier, there were about 20 some of these messages. And this was the longest of the, of the 20. And so I would work on these. I did frequency counts. So if we go to the next slide, you can, I, I did the good uh, cryptanalytic thing and tallied up the number of uh, occurrences of each letter of all 20 messages I had. And you can see there are lots of C's, G's, K's, V's, and Y's. And there's a lot of roughness there. Uh, also, there are lots of spaces. So space is a character, and I didn't know if it was or not. Uh, 398 of those occurred. You can see there's a, a roughness there, but it wasn't a one for one substitution. I wasn't able to break into it. So I would look at the messages and uh, I, I, I wanted to find out some information about uh, uh, Mr. Hafer and where did he live and that, that kind of stuff. So if we go to the next slide, I developed or gathered a crypto history. So where did Charles Hafer live? So I asked Paul Kronmeier, who brought the messages, where did he live? And he responded back, next slide that it was almost certainly in Adams County, Pennsylvania. So here's a map of Pennsylvania and Adams County is highlighted in red down here. And uh, the county seat of Adams County is Gettysburg, which is the home of one of the famous Civil War battles that we had. Immediately to the east of uh, Adams County is York County, which is uh, a neat, uh, neat county. And I'll show you why in a second. If we go to the next slide, if we look at the, uh, the current map of uh, where, where, the, where things are. Abbottstown is uh, the town where he probably lived. And uh, you can see that it's about halfway between Gettysburg and York. And it's about 15 miles between each of those cities. Amazingly, if we go to the next slide, I happen to live in Glenrock, Pennsylvania, just 15 miles away from Abbottstown as well. So, uh, it, but that's as the crow flies. You can see there are no direct routes for me to get from Glenrock to Abbottstown. So anyway, a lot of the cities that uh, he was mentioning in his diaries in the unenciphered parts were sh showing up on this map, like uh, New Oxford and East Berlin. So if we go to the next slide, I was continuing to gather my crypto history. Uh, I wanted to know what was his occupation? Did he have some background in uh, ciphers? Why did he encipher stuff like this? And uh, Paul's response, next slide, was uh, he didn't know if he had any, what, what his job was, but he would ask. My next uh, next slide. Uh, my next question was any charts or alphabet strips or cipher disks that he might have used to encipher or, or so that we could use to decipher the messages. And I, I, again, I asked that of Paul and his response was on the next slide. Uh, didn't think so, but he'll ask. Finally, my last question while I was gathering the crypto history was where are the diaries now? And he said almost assuredly they were in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Next slide which is where the, uh, the, the great, great granddaughter of Charles Hafer lives right now. And that's uh, uh, Amy Johnson is her name. And she happens to be the family historian for the Hafers. She uh, compiled genealogy and everything like that. But this is one part that was missing from the genealogy. Let's go to the next slide. Um, OK, so going back to this uh, cipher entry in uh, May 1st, 1905, I happen to notice, and I'll write it out in, in print letters instead of script letters, go to the next slide, that in this particular message, there were five occurrences of one letter words. So there's a C, a K, a Y, a G, and an X. And you know, I would look at it for a long time and set it aside. And it was one night after I had set it aside for like three weeks, I pulled it back out and I was looking at it. It was well after midnight. And I said, you know, I really want those one letter words to be A or I since they're one letter words in English. And I noticed that, hey, you know, if you use the 26 letter alphabet wrapping around A through Z or A through Z, and uh, if you go backwards two from the A, you get a Y. If you go ahead two from the A, you get a C, which are two of the letters mentioned here. Similarly, the plain text letter I, if you go backwards two letters, you get to G, but if you go ahead two letters, you get to K. So I figured maybe the C's and Y's are A's and the G's and K's are I's. And maybe that's how this was enciphered, where each of the letters in the cipher was either two ahead or two back 
from the actual plain text character. So the next thing I did, go to the next slide, is I wrote out all possible uh, entry or possible plain text values for each of these uh, cipher letters that appeared in that, that entry. So for the cipher UC at the beginning, if you go backwards to, you get to an S for the U. If you go ahead to, you get a W. Similarly for C, if you go backwards to, you get A. If you go ahead to, you get an E. And you can see the word we appearing there. Uh, similarly for the next one, J, Y, B. J goes to H or L. Y is W or A. B is Z or D. And you can see the word had appearing there. If you go to the next slide, and I've highlighted the uh, suspected letters that showed up again, you can see that there's plain text showing up here. We had a little spat today at dinner. If you go to the next slide, I've got just those uh, those highlighted letters there. We had a little spat today at dinner. I was going to slap Fanny's mouth. Then Ella cut me in the finger with a butcher knife. I had said nothing to her. She is a word that starts with B. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. But Fanny is a daughter of uh, Charles Hafer, and Ella is his wife. So I'm thinking these are going to be juicy messages. I got to read some more. So of the remaining messages that I had, I said, well, maybe this two ahead, two before thing will work for all those. And in fact, they did. So I was able to compile uh, the decrypts for all 20 of these messages. And I gave them to Paul Kronmeyer, who gave them to his brother, who gave them to his girlfriend, who gave them to her dad. Who's, uh, whose name is Homer Hafer. And he said, this is great. We got to get him the rest of the diary so he can decrypt the whole thing. And it turns out there were 139 different messages in all the diaries. So they invited me over to uh, the Hafer house and they gave me a big scrapbook filled with information on Charles Hafer, uh, pictures and everything. And uh, they gave me all the diaries that they had, had ranging from 1899 to 1928. So 30 years worth of diaries. If we go to the next slide, so just who is this Charles Hafer? Well, Charles Hafer was born on January 23rd, 1862. And uh, we know he was born in Indiana, but we don't know when he relocated to Abbottstown. So it's entirely possible that as a 17 month old kid, he could have been toddling around the house when just 15 miles down the road in Gettysburg, the big Civil War battle is raging on. Um, it's, it's, it's possible. We don't know for sure, though. Uh, so what did he do? Let's go to the next slide. It's more like what didn't he do? Because he had a whole bunch of, of occupations. His main uh, occupation was cigar maker. He would uh, roll cigars and pack cigars for any of the 10 different uh, cigar shops that were uh, that were there in Abbottstown, little dinky town, and one of his jobs was doing a census. He would do one every year for the city of Abbottstown, city, town of Abbottstown, and uh, there turned out to be 324 mem or people living in Abbottstown in 1924 when he did that census. Happened to be included in the diaries, which was pretty cool. Also, in addition to making cigars, he was the anesthesiologist for the town doctor, so he assisted with surgeries. He would break rocks on the roads leading to Abbottstown because it was horse-drawn carriages in those days, and so they wanted to make sure there weren't any ruts for the, for the carriages to get stuck in. So he would break these rocks to make the, the pebbles and fill in the ruts and everything. He was a, uh, a tombstone installer, uh, able to, to put the tombstones in as well as make inscriptions on them. He was uh, big in the Republican Party in Adams County and served as the election judge for the uh, for the county uh, for Adams County. And he was also a census taker but for the federal government. So every 10 years when the federal government did, did their uh, uh, census, he did it for Adams uh, for Abbottstown. Uh, he would repair horse drawn carriages. So he would fix the wagon wheels and things, which is which a pretty cool occupation. He served on the school board as its director. He was a newspaper correspondent writing a weekly column for the Hanover Evening Sun in Hanover, Pennsylvania. And he also served as the town registrar, which, uh, entitled, which made him uh, the person to sign the birth and death certificates for everybody in town. Let's go to the next slide. So, so here's a, uh, his very first entry, at least it may be his first, we'll put that in air quotes. Uh, from August 24th, 1899, it says Ella took, it looks like 11,111 morphia pills. Uh, it's probably just the number five. So because he's the, the town anesthetician, or anesthetician uh, he had access to morphine, which is, and was called morphia back then. Uh, so 
so she's getting into his stash of drugs. So let's go to the next slide. And we don't know if it's for sure if this is his very first cipher because at the very last entry in, in his 1899 diary, he says, this is the first diary I've kept for an entire year, often started but never completed one. So we don't know for sure if it's his first entry, but it's the first one that was available to me. Let's go to the next slide. So I, I decrypted the 20 some messages that I had, and I had mentioned this project that I was working on uh, to my friend in New Zealand, Bart Wenneckers. And he said, oh, this is a pretty neat, neat, uh, neat cipher system. Uh, let me write a program to help you break these rest of the messages out. And so he said, oh, we'll make it so that you just have to type in the cipher and it'll go through all the words that have been recovered so far from all the ciphers that you've decrypted. It will try to match words with the cipher from two ahead to two behind in the alphabet, and it will try to decrypt it. And so this is the entry from uh, February 28, 1900. It says Ella is running either thinks or things pretty strong. She will TWG it, mark this date. So the, the VK, I'm sorry, VJK PIQ cipher letter, uh, cipher there, it could decrypt either thinks or things, either would be valid decryptions. Uh, based on this cipher system. And both those words showed up in the word list. So I had to pick out which one make most sense, make mo made most sense contextually. Uh, the TWG down there didn't decrypt anything that was in the word list. Uh, but it says, if, if you look beneath it here, uh, it says unmatched word TWG possibly sue. The word sue is in my, on my word list at that point. Uh, it actually most con most sense contextually is the word rue. Uh, she she's, uh, she's running things pretty strong. She will rue it. Mark this date. So so rue is the one that that shows up uh, that should be the word that fits in there. Uh, Bart used digraphic scoring to give me possible word values for each of the letters that uh, I typed in, and so rye is the highest scoring one there. Uh, but a rue is the actual one we, we needed. Uh, it could possibly be sue though, because if just one letter was off in each of these uh, uh, words that he was trying to decrypt, it would give me that as a possibility. And sue does show up in my word list, and we'll talk about sue in just a little bit. If we go to the next slide, uh, here's another uh, example of, of Bart's program. Uh, from March 10th, 1900, the madam made an ass of herself by dancing like a DGMN. So one of the unintended uh, things that Bart's program did, which was beneficial to me, is that if I had mistyped a letter in the cipher, it would correct it if there was just one letter that was off. And because everything was written in script, I had an awful tough time sometimes uh, decrypting or trying to determine whether Charles Hafer had written a script Q or a script G. Here I thought it was a G, so I typed in DGMN, but had I typed in DQMN, then it would have decrypted correctly as the word fool. So the word fool is the one that I actually needed here. And he 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 made a, a he forgot to encipher the, the letter A there in plain text. Uh, so by, so the madam made an ass of herself by dancing like a fool. Um, every time he would, he, most of the encipherments dealt with his wife, Ella. And uh, he re often referred to her as the madam. We'll see why. Go to the next. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, th the messages were were. She would regularly leave him, uh, and for no apparent reason. And uh, here's the entry from March 12, 1905. The madam went to York yesterday. They say she'll be home tomorrow. She never tells me when she goes away. So trouble on the home front. But he's he's enciphering these messages maybe as evidence for a potential divorce case in the future. I don't know. Nobody knows for sure. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, he learned something then in uh, September of that year, in 1905, that uh, the entire family, uh, he says the entire family is moving out. Uh, so the, uh, the entire family was away last night. I was home alone. What I learned is down at Nikki's. Nikki's is a, uh, a, a gathering place, a watering hole there in Abbottstown. Uh, Madam, I am informed that the family intend to move to York soon. Everything is done behind my back. I'm perfectly satisfied. So, OK, let's go to the next slide. And sure enough, later that the next weekend, they did move out. They moved to, to York, as, as mentioned, took all the furniture with them, except for a few things that he still was left. So he had a place to sit 
and write his journals and place to sleep. That's other than that, everything else is pretty much gone. Um, th there's a love interest perhaps in here. On February 19th, 1905, he wrote, some person wrote a letter to Jake Wolf and told him to watch me that I am after his wife. I think I know who wrote it. We have no indications to who wrote it. Maybe it was Ella, maybe it was somebody else. I don't know. So, but uh, there's something going on with Jake Wolf's wife who happens to be named Sue. If we go to the next slide, um, in 1906, here we go, in July 26, he writes, yesterday, Mrs. Sue Wolf fell and cut her hand badly. I helped to sew up the cut. I think a great deal of that woman. So he's expressing his, his affections for Sue Wolf in this, this particular encipherment. And if we go to the next slide, there may have been some reciprocal feelings as well, because on March 30th, 1907, he writes, Sue, I think, is going to try to quit loving me. I won't coax her, but I love her. OK, so let's go to the next slide. So um, so he's still married to Ella. And oh, yes, yeah, so, so Sue Wolf, that's right. Uh, this the Internet is wonderful. So uh, I was able to find the death certificate for Sue Wolf, and she died in 1921, October 9th, 1921, and she died of typhoid fever. And if you look who signed the death certificate down there in the middle on the bottom, it's none other than Charles Hafer. So the, the small world, right? <laughs> but we knew he was the town registrar, so he would sign that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, so he's still married to Ella, but uh, there, there, there's a, a, a woman that comes into his life in 1908, Eliza Arabella Bell Stambaugh. And this is a picture of, of Bell. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we got this, uh, this decrypt uh, from December 13th, 1908. It says that after I closed in the evening, Bell came over and we had a good time from nine o'clock until 11. She is a warm RKCEC, but clean and nice, and I like her. And of course, according to Bart's program down here, RKCEC, uh, the word peace is like the sixth thing in the list there. And so that's the word that we want contextually. Uh, so she's a warm piece, but clean and nice, and I like her. So he's showing interest for this woman, Belle, uh, because his shop was, was just, just down the street from where Belle lived. If we go to the next slide, things really start heating up in, in 1909. Um, March the 18th, Belle gave me one this afternoon. March 19th, got another one from Belle today. Uh, two days later, same as Friday. So, so it, things are getting interesting in his encipherments. Let's go on to the next slide, and you can see that uh, in 1910, Bell got pregnant. I learned that Bell is pregnant. Expect I will or will be in for it. So he 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 knows that you know he's probably the dad. So we go to the next slide, and uh, on June the 12th, 1910, expect B to have a baby in a few weeks. And on July 2nd, B had a little girl baby this morning. Now soon the fun for settlement will begin. I will or well have no trouble with Bell. So I will have no trouble with Bell. And three days later, he writes that Bell and the baby are doing well. So it is a girl. Uh, so he, he's probably, he's father to uh, Francis Catherine Hafer. If we go to the next slide, four years later, it looks like she's pregnant again. I fear B is pregnant. I hope not, but all indications point that way. And he indicates that he's went, he went to Gettysburg on J January the 14th, 1915 uh, to consult a lawyer about getting a divorce from the madam, but I will have to wait until a mirror court. Let's go to the next slide. So, you know, with, even though he's married to Ella, he's probably got two kids now by, by Bell. So he's going to make you know, going to make it legit here and get married to Bell. And so it, it, sure enough, on June 7th, 1915, uh, Bell gave birth to a baby boy, Newell Henry Hafer at 645. And he indicates that he was there. And if you go to the next slide uh, later on that month. And so June 21st, 1915, uh, a divorce was granted to me Monday by Judge Samuel McSwope, was not up to hear it and only found out today. So he didn't learn about it until two days later. But he's officially divorced from Ella, who's still living in New York. And uh, now he's free to marry Belle. If we go to the next slide, he does indicate that in his diaries that on August, if we go to the next slide there, August 22nd, 1915, 
Bell and I were married this evening about nine o'clock by S.A. Nagel, Justice of the Peace. No one knows it and we did not want it known. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so after he got married to Bell, Charles Hafer moved in with Bell, and this is where Bell lived, and this is what it looks like today, still standing there in Abbottstown on the main drag. Uh, if you look to the left of the, the house, there's a vacant lot that's owned by St. John's uh, uh, Lutheran Church, and uh, immediately to the left of that, there's another structure there with a green roof. That is uh, a slave -off shop where uh, Charles Hafer repaired the wagon wheels, and so, or I'm sorry, not slave uh, standbaugh shop. So that's that's where he worked in, in, in Sp I'm sorry, George Spangler's shop. That's it. Uh, so I, that's where he worked repairing the wheels, and that's where they first met and uh, did stuff. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. Um, Just about five minutes, neat, sir. Yes, some of the neat historical stuff that we we encountered uh, when I was going through the the diaries that wasn't enciphered. In 1910, he talked about Haley's Comet coming along. And it says it's beautiful in the western sky immediately after dark uh, for a few evenings only. It will be visible again in 75 or 76 years. This is two iterations ago of Halley's Comet because it came back again in 1986. It will revisit us again in 2062. Next slide, please. And this will hit close to home. Uh, from Monday, September the 30th, the Spanish flu, he's writing about that because he's on the Board of Health in Adams County. And he says influenza is very bad throughout the entire county, especially in the army cantonments. Many are dying with it. It's spreading about here and there are a number of cases here now. And as there are no precautionary measures taken, I fear it will grow worse. His fears became the truth. As we go to the next slide, uh, five days later, he writes in his diary that the entire state has been put under quarantine for the influenza. I've just received a telegram from the state health commissioner. Uh, have the quarantine restrictions enforced here. All public meetings to be stopped, saloons and all places of amusement to close, and schools and churches to close at the discretion of the local health board. Sounds very familiar to what we went through two years ago. If we go to the next slide, uh, in about five weeks later, Monday, November 11th, 1918, uh, it's the end of World War I didn't call it World War One back then, but the armistice was signed that morning and uh, at 11 o'clock French time. And it says he went to York with W.E. Haynes and Otto to see the parade in honor of the peace announcements. It was a large parade. So back then, autos were first uh, making their appearance in York County and so and, and then uh, Adams County. And so he traveled to York for a big parade. Never mind, there's a pandemic going on here. Let's gather some people together to celebrate, right? Let's go to the next slide. And this, this one will hit home too. Uh, from May 31st, 1902, this is the year for the 17-year locust to make its appearance. And they're making their appearances in large numbers in this section of the county. So if you take 17 years and multiply by seven cycles, uh, that's 119. And the 19, 119 added to 1902 is 2021. And sure enough, last year, those cicadas came back and, and haunted us again with their obnoxious sounds. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is, next slide, Charles Hafer died November 3rd, 1940. And if we go to the next slide, he's buried in the cemetery at St. John's Lutheran Church in Abbottstown, just two blocks behind where uh, Charles Hafer lived. It's a really cool cemetery. Revolutionary War uh, soldiers are buried there, and uh, that's where Charles Hafer is. If we go to the next slide. We were able to find his grave site, and uh, he's buried there along with his son Newell. If we go to the next slide, there we go, and uh, his wife Belle. So Newell only lived about a year, a little bit more than a year, and died in 1916. Uh, Belle lived, though, to the age of 95, died in, died in 1971. So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, Homer and Patty Hafer. Homer's the grandson of, of Charles Hafer, and he's 79 years old now. Spry guy, he's a terrific guy. Married to Patty for 54 years. They're a terrific couple, and I thank them for inviting me into their home and sharing all this information with me. Uh, we go to the next slide. Uh, we'd like to also thank, uh, in addition to Homer and Patty, Amy Johnson, their daughter, who's the family genealogist who assembled everything, Paul Kronmeyer, who brought me the original ciphers to look at, Bart Wenmeckers for his uh, 
for his uh, program that he wrote, and my wife, Lori Bogart, who did a lot of the, uh, the, the genealogy research on Charles Hafer. And if we go to the next slide, my contact information is there, and I'll be happy to entertain questions once we get to the, uh, after the, the final speaker today. And I'll throw it back to Dr. Lazary at this point. Uh, hello again. Uh, is it possible to show the slide? Okay, so we just heard about uh, a cipher from the 19th and 20th century. Uh, before that, about the 20th century, and this one. Now we're going back in time to the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Uh, in, basically, uh, I, I've been working on quite a lot of ciphers, but those are really the, uh, the earliest one I've been working on, and uh, this project is very large and comprehensive and fascinating. And I'm happy to present it to you today. There is also an article in, in the Cryptologia with all the details. Um, I won't be have enough time to go into all the details. Next slide, please. So I want to start with uh, a few, uh, some some background about uh, Vatican cipher or papal ciphers at the time. Then I'm going to present the collections. Where are those ciphers uh, located? Where how they were found and and, and obtained? Uh, how uh, I decipher them, and then some finding from that work. Next slide, please. Uh, starting with the background, next slide, please. So uh, what are the sources? What do we know about Papal Cipher? So there is a very interesting book. Uh, it's in German, so it's, I had to use the Google Translate and some of my German uh, colleagues to help me. It was written by Alois Speister in, in, in the beginning in 1906. And it has a lot of information about ciphers about the 16th century used by the, the popes. Uh, and it also contains a treatise by the Argenti, two uh, a family of cryptographers that actually uh, propelled the Vatican, uh, I mean, the papal cipher to the forefront of the, of the cryptographic science or in the, in, at the time, at the end of the 16th century, beginning of, of the 19th century, of the 16th, 17th century, sorry. Uh, next, please. Uh, on the 17th century, there is no research. I mean, it's very surprising, but there is nothing. There is no, no paper, no books, nothing. The only thing that we had is that we have uh, uh, a, a, the, the, the Decrypt project put online two of those uh, ciphers, and they were sold by independent researchers before that. So we had a decipherment. We had an idea how things should look at that century, but there is no paper, no research. I think uh, next slide, please. And the 18th century, there is practically nothing, no paper, no research, no book. So we had no idea what to expect from that, that period. And, uh, and next slide, please. And then from the 19th and 20th century, uh, there is a very interesting uh, paper that by David Alvarez that talks about the decline of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the papal cryptography. Uh, so in the 16th century, we have a very strong cryptographic uh, organization in the Vatican, and in the 19th and 20th century, we, are, we have a very quick one, but we have nothing that tells us what happened in the, in the middle, what, what was the evolution in the middle. Next slide, please. So uh, a, a few words on terminology. There are many conflicting terminology, and this is the one that I'm go going to use. A cipher is a combination of a code. Code is, is a way to encipher specific letters mainly, sometimes also syllables, but mainly letters. And the nomenclature, it's a list of names, places, and common words that have their own codes, their own code number, uh, and are, are completing the, the, the code. And the idea is that uh, if you are using a, a word like end in English, you don't want to spell it out uh, every time because it will reveal a lot of information uh, about uh, frequency analysis and so on. So you, have, you want to have a, a certain word, a certain code or code, code the combination to represent it. Next slide, please. Next, please. OK, so how do they look? And they are look almost all of them look the same. They are just continuous digits. So the big challenge is that you have no ideas how to cut them. That's the biggest challenge. When you, when you are able to cut, to, to cut that sequence into subsequences, OK, let's say that 3, 5 at the beginning is a code and not 3, 5, 8 at the beginning, then you can start to, to use the, the, your tools. But if you don't know how to cut them, it's a very big challenge, and we'll go back to that challenge in, at, in, uh, later on. And then also we know from the Argentis, the, the famous cryptographists, that uh, there were very strict rules how to, to prepare the text for encoding. So first you had to remove all the punctuation, 
all the words separation like spaces, all the double letters that will reveal some statistical pattern like uh, double SS, they had to be replaced by a single S, and then some letters at all had to be thrown away uh, because they were not uh, critical in understanding the, 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 the text after the decipherment. Next, please. So the first part is uh, is the code, and usually, usually this is homophonic. Homophonic means that, uh, for example, for A, A could be represented by 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, and 2. Uh, so typically this will be for letters. Letters will be uh, represented by, by a specific code, and, and, and sometimes, but not, not always, you will have common word in Italian, et and con are very common, uh, and uh, et, and, et and is and and con is with. A, and they have their own code, typically one or two digits, sometimes three digits. Next, please. The nomenclature, those are places, names, terms, common suffixes, and they are typically three or four digits, sometimes with some special marking. You can see here there is a dot on top of the, of the second uh, digit. Next, please. And the next feature is the nulls. Nulls are just symbols that are there to confuse the, the decipherer. And they mean nothing. You just need to ignore them. But they, they complicate the, the, the statistical analysis. Next, please. Some example of special signs that you can find. Here, then you can see here. Uh, typically, there will be variation over numbers, over digits. There will be some of those of digits. Next slide, please. What type of cipher did they use? Okay, we know how there is a code. There is, we know that there is a nomenclature, we know there is not, but what, how are things uh, encoded? So the first form, which is very, very, very rare, I mean, I have one, only one, is the monoalphabetic. So every letter has a one combination that represents that letter. So for example, A will always be six, B will always be 84 in this example. Next, please. The most common uh, a, a pattern is what we call homophonic. Homophonic means that for every letter, you may have more than one representation. For example, A will be 0, 1 and 1, 0. Or E, which is also very frequent, will be 1, 5 and 5, 5. Why is that? Because if, if E is going to, have to occur very, uh, very often, we don't want it to, to we, you want, don't want the, the 15, for example, to be with too high frequency. So we need additional option on top of the 15, like which is represented in the E. So here what we have an example that every letter is represented by two digits. We call them fixed length homophones. Next slide, please. The next pattern is when you have variable length homophones. So the, each letters could be represented by either one or two digits. And if you remember the, 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 the continuous digits, how do I know if the, if the homophone don't have the same lengths, how do I know that one begins and what ends? And this is what that was more, one of the main challenges in solving those ciphers in ciphers with that we call variable lengths homophone. Next, please. The last one is very interesting. This is what we call polyphonic. So uh, homophonic means that for each plant and letter, plant text letter, we have more than one code. Polyphonic actually is the opposite. For each code, which in that case is only one digit, you may have two options. For example, one may represent an A, but also represent a D. So now when you have the decoder and it has the key, how does it know what to do? Then it will know it by, by practice, by understanding of the context. So basically it's not a deterministic. You, have, you need to, to, to have some clues to help you to decover, to decipher even if you know the key. But if you don't know the key, it's even more interesting. Next, please. Next, okay. okay, so that was a background about what was known before the project on, on, on Papal Cipher. And then uh, when I joined the project DECRI, DECRI is an international proje uh, project with multiple universities that uh, our, our goal is to gather a uh, cipher collections in, in, uh, in uh, national library and national archives to transcribe them, to digitize them, and then to try to, to, try to break the code. So I'm working on quite a few uh, other examples from that uh, from that project, but this is definitely the most uh, comprehensive one and, and one of the most interesting. So uh, basically, what uh, the project did, it, it just uh, before the the COVID period, went to the Vatican and asked the archivists to say, okay, please find help us to find as many as cipher and cipher letters that you can find, and they were very helpful and they were very helpful. But they were also paid with a lot of money because <laughs> it's very expensive to get those services and. And then we were able to uh, to get copies uh, of those uh, of uh, 
of a, a lot of examples from three centuries, which is very, very comprehensive. There are still some that we did not cover, but we believe that we have covered the vast majority of them. Next, please. Next slide, please. So uh, just an example of, of collections. You can see dates, you can see their, their provenance. They pick, typically, there will be messages sent by the, the, the Papal Nuncio, the, 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 basically the ambassador or the Pope, to various places like Colonia, which was uh, Belgium and Germany at the time, France with his friends, and you have Spain and you have Portugal. Uh, the, those envoys uh, were appointed by the Pope and they were sent there and they were sending back their reports in, 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 with using those ciphers. So you can see that we have multiple collections with multiple periods. Uh, and next slide, please. And, uh, and uh, some of them with large quantities of material and some of them with very little material. And, uh, and um, two of them, as I said, were solved by public challenges and they could uh, give us some idea how they should look, but it was only for two examples. Next, please. So the process of deciding the collection is a very complex one, and I have a paper also, it's also about 60 pages on that. Uh, if you want to, to learn more about the process of decoding, then they, I invite you to read the paper. And if you don't have access to the paper, please send me an email, I will send it to you. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. The process of the cipher the collection was very complex, and I'm going to try to, try to condense that in, in a few minutes. But basically, first we wanted to, just we have many, many collections, who are, uh, can we group those ciphertexts by the key that they were used? So we don't know the key, but can we find some patterns in the ciphertext that we can say, okay, those belong together? Because if you try to solve them together, something which has a, a cipher and one we have a nice, another cipher key, then you will get very bad uh, statistics. Then uh, we had to make progress by matching plain text with ciphertext. In some cases, we were able to find some plain text, and then I will explain how to do that. And then we started, started to attack the homophonic ciphers. First, the, 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 the less challenging, the one with fixed length homophone, and then with the, the one with variable length homophone. Remember, that's a big challenge when you have continuous sequence of digits. And then the polysonic cipher, and then uh, I can summarize. Please, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So, the next slide, please. Uh, thanks. First thing we needed to do is, and we had a lot of material, we have more than, you have, we had half a million of symbols from scribes. So manually, it's not possible to say, okay, these belong to the same. So basically we believe that if they were in the same place in the archive, they should, they should go together, but that was not always the, the case. So basically what we develop is a clustering. Clustering is, a, is, a, is an algorithm to group things together according to some statistical characteristic. And uh, the goal was to uh, automatically try to group them together. And uh, also one of the purpose of this exercise is that, let's say that I have one document, I can try to attack that document. If I can have more documents with the same key, then I'm more likely to break the code. So it's also, it was also mean to have more material for each key. So I won't get into the details. The, the basic algorithm was, uh, was came in clustering and the result are in the next slide, please. So basically what we found, and you can see here the, some color coding is that in most cases, actually, if you if in the Vatican one folder holds a set of ciphers, then those those ciphers will be with the same key. But as you can see, there are some ex some ex some ex a, um, some exceptions. Sometimes you could have two folder with the same key, and sometimes you could have in the same folder two different keys. But that algorithm, the, the clustering, actually helped us to sort that out, and it was very helpful. Next slide, please. So the next thing is about matching plain text. Can we use existing plain text to find a key? Next slide, please. So in some cases, uh, next slide. Please. We there is some plain text in the in the the, the document. It's probably because the the, the, the clerk that received the, the the cipher text actually wrote the this, the decryption on top of the digits. So this is the base case when you can it's, it's next. It's one to one. It takes a little while to 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 read the Italian. Uh, but uh, it's this is the easiest case. Next, next, please. Then, in some cases, we have uh, we have the text, but it's not it's separate from the code. So it could be on the same page, it could be on a different page. So you have to 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 find and you have to do a lot of trial and errors. But that, that that's so helpful. Next slide, please. So how do you do that? 
then it's kind of a many, very, very manual process. It could be computerized, but basically uh, you try to uh, to to you, you you try some some stuff and then if it works, you continue. If it doesn't, you don't continue. Sometimes you can find some patterns. You can see in the handwritten one that the I are all under the column two, and most of them are under column. Uh, they're all under the column two. So sometimes they will say they would say that z that two and two two and four two and five two. And four two are uh, sorry two two and three two are I so it's it's weak cryptography but sometimes it's it's helpful sometimes you, you do we didn't have that clue but basically we were able to find some keys doing with doing that matching pattern next slide please For next uh, after we exhausted that possibility we started to attack with computer as algorithm and we started with those that we thought would be with fixed lengths next slide please. So what we found out that there are many, many schemes and we found that scheme by using the, the, the Plantech match, matching. So we had some entry point, but we had some failure. We, we didn't have that entry point. So we tried started to understand how are they built? So sometimes the null is a three, sometimes the null is a five. Sometimes the code is, is two digits. Sometimes the code is three digit. Sometimes the nomenclature starts with a four and so on. So there are many schemes that we need. The only that we, what we did basically we just tried all, all of them until we get a, some solution. Next slide, please. And the algorithm that we found that we use is basically uh, simulated and living. It's, it's another form of field climbing. And the idea is to find is to map the, the homophone to say, okay, a F will be represented by will be represented by zero zero and maybe three two and maybe five one or something like that. We wanted to find that map. And uh, the the drawback of this algorithm is it doesn't it doesn't tell you the nomenclature. It doesn't give you the the code for the Pope. Or the code for a word like uh, a or end or corn or whatever. So, but with that, we're able to find out a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the homophones. Next slide, please. Uh, the the bigger challenge was with homophonic ciphers with variable lengths because we can we don't know how to cut them into codes. As you can see, as we showed before, sometimes even this is very misleading because, for example, e could be two, could be two one. And could be two one two, so I have no idea. I start. I see the text two one two, and then something else. And then I don't know if I should stop stop after the first two, after the one, or after the second two. So then it start to. It, it's a process is much more uh, complicated. And then we needed some additional tools. Next slide, please. And I'm, I'm showing here only the the most basic. First is was to to try to uh, to find uh, matching plain text, and. Uh, and the second type of, t of tool was to, to, to try to extract some structure, even if you cannot decipher it, just understand the structure, and then maybe look for the key in, the so in sources. And if it is the 16th century, then maybe Meister is a good candidate. Next slide, please. So first is, how do, do you find pairs of homophones? So how do you know, for example, that, that 2 and 2, 1, a are uh, represented E, for example. For first thing is that we want to find out, and it, this example I give it for 25 and 52, are 25 and 52 the same letter? Even if I don't know which letter, can I say upfront that they represent the same letter, they are homophones? And one of the methods that is used, and it was used historically, historically but we can also computerize it, is actually, if I see something before 25 and something after 25, and I, and I see the same thing, before 52 and after 52, maybe 52 and 25 are the same, especially if, if I see that more than once. So that's, that's a way to find some likely homophone. Doesn't work always, but it's a good indicator. Next slide, please. The next challenge is to, so, to see how are the, the nomenclature codes built. So sometimes they have uh, some, special di some special marking on top. So then you don't know, is it on the first digit? Is it on the second digit? Is it on the third digit? Is it all at all three digits? So the only thing to, we can do is just check all those possibilities. So basically we check here, is it on the first digit? Is it on the second digit? Is it on the third digit? And then you count them. And we found out that if you put the dot on top of the second digit, then you will find more occurrences of those codes. So probably we, we thought for that specific cipher, maybe the nomenclature is Something like one six six. The the second six, the the six in the middle has a dot on top of it. Next slide, please. And based on that, so we had expected homophones, and then we had expected nomenclature, 
And then we had some information from some the, from so the, from the signature and from the collection itself, but very very limited. And we say, okay, based on that, can we find in, this, in Meister, for example, a key that looks like that? And then for some of the more challenging ciphers, we were able actually to uh, to use it. So it's not pure cryptanalysis, but it's the research is cryptanalytic cryptanalysis as assisted uh, archive research. Next, please. Polyphonic ciphers, a, and uh, so I, I'm presenting that very, very shortly, but it was a very, very long process, and we, we are talking about 20 plus ciphers with half a million symbols, so that's a lot of work, and um, it, it took a lot of time, and uh, sometimes we, we got into dead end, sometimes we had uh, we were lucky, a, a, but, um, and I will get the result at the end. So polyphonic cipher is, the, is, is again the, the, the case in which uh, a digit can re represent two possible letters. And this is a challenge because we don't know which letter. So we know the digit, but we don't know which letter. So we know that one digit is, is, is a code, but also there is one of the digits that can be a null. So we don't know which one is it. So how can we break that? So first is if we can so find some matching plain text and we found a couple of them. And then also we have a, a, a process which is automated key recovery for polyphonic cipher. Next slide, please. Um, basically, the idea is let's first find the null, and then let's find let's map the, the the remaining nine digits into nine pairs of letters. And by the way, they just threw out a couple of letters that were uh, used less frequently. The algorithm is, a, is again based on simulated annealing, and the core is a special score because we have to look. Basically, we have if we if we are looking and here we are looking at five consecutive digits, so it gives us 22 options. So we need to evaluate all of them, and then uh, at the end uh, you can get some good idea how it looks and it get good results. And that's the way that we solve the additional uh, polyphonic ciphers. Next slide, please. Uh, summary. Next slide, please. Um, running out of time, I'm afraid. So basically, we solved practically everything. You can see here the list, how it was solved. Uh, they were solved and uh, uh, next slide, please. There is still one which is unsolved. Uh, and uh, you have to get, and next slide, please, let's go to the summary. Um, ne next slide, please. Uh, okay, so we solved six from ciphertext only, 10 from plain text, one uh, using uh, Structural analysis, three were solved as public challenges, and uh, one is still unsolved. Whoever wants to solve that, I'm happy to send you the link to the challenge. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we learn from that uh, research about papal cryptography? Next slide, please. So uh, next slide, please. So in the 16th century, as we have, as it has been documented in Meister, there is a high diversity of cipher. There are many types. Monoalphabetic for the very, very most simple one, a homophonic for the most complex with variable lengths to make them even more challenging. And polyphonic, uh, sometimes uh, Argenti say that if you, are, if you are in Germany, for example, you don't need a very strong cipher as you need if you are in France. So uh, they, were, they, they knew about the capability of, their, uh, of, the, of the country they were in and they were using uh, accordingly the, the right cipher and they, so it was you you were not compromising a cipher by using in two countries so and the focus one was on security with the continuous digits uh variable length codes which is which makes that very very challenging even with modern computing and removing all the redundant language features like the double letters the functions and so on so that this is the 16th century next slide in the 17th and 18th century Somehow you can see that all that the, the, that table turns to, to green, and green means the easiest one, which are the homophonic with fixed lengths. So what we found is that in the 19th, in 17th and 18th century, they reverted to very simple stuff, simple stuff to use, simple stuff to decipher, and simple st stuff to break. And it's what is remarkable is that nothing changed. I mean, whatever the, the simple cases that they had in the 16th century were used at the end of the 18th century. And that's uh, that's very interesting for, because especially if we, we remember that together with Venice, the the Rome and the, and the, and the Vatican and the, and the Papal Cipher were the most advanced in Europe at the time. 
and uh, that decline is very interesting. Next slide, please. So uh, just to summarize uh, I, our contribution, so uh, we believe this is the largest set and the largest uh, uh, collections of papal cipher deciphered uh, that span over three centuries. It complements Meister for the 16th, 16th century, exposes diversity and practices. A Meister only pro produced keys. Here we also have deciphertext and we can see how the, how the keys were used in, in, in practice. For 17th and 18th century, this is the only source of, uh, for, uh, for information about purple ciphers, and we see the events of decline. And we have some material which is deciphered for the first time. Some of it exists in plain text, so it's not very interesting for, for a historian, but some of the material is really for the first time here. And we have a set, new set of tools that have been used for other ciphers. And the question I, I'm getting asked a lot, thank you, uh, so just one sentence. I'm getting asked a lot about what are in those ciphers. I mean, everyone wants to, to hear about pornography, uh, scandals, Jews and, and, and Nazi, and, Nazi and, and World War II. So I, I don't have anything about World War II. And I, the first, all of them, surprisingly, they are not in Latin, they are in Italian. All of the ciphers are in Italian. And the contents are on, almost only politics, religion wars, and money. But those are the only contents. There is nothing else. If we are looking for something juicy for uh, Dan Brown uh, topics for the next book or something like that, then nothing like we will appear. Some of the messages are uh, quite boring. Some of them are uh, like uh, the same complaints that you expect from an ambassador. I want more money. I want more uh, help uh, and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Lasbury. Uh, we have a handful of questions here. We have two for Mr. Bogart. Uh, I'll go ahead and bundle those together. Uh, the first, um, did you examine census records to narrow down when Hafer moved to Abbottstown? And the second question is, how did the family react to the decryptions that you found in his diary? Um, so the first question was about uh, the census records. We did look at the census records, uh, but we weren't able to, uh, let's see, find out exactly when he moved to, to Abbottstown. Um, uh, and it wasn't until he actually started doing, counting his own censuses, or doing the census himself, that we were able to actually pinpoint that, okay, he's doing the census at this time. Um, the family, surprisingly, was overwhelmingly like, yes, please, let's let's decrypt the rest of these. Uh, they were, uh, I, there's stuff in there that I didn't mention in the briefing today that I think if it was for my family, I wouldn't want it revealed to the world. And so just to protect the family name, I, you know, I'm, we're keeping this as clean as possible. But uh, uh, yeah, they were, they were overwhelmingly thankful for uh, finally putting an end to this mystery that had plagued them for uh, over a century. Excellent. We have one further question for you, Bob. Um, okay. I think you may have started to address it. Are scans of all the diary pages available for public consumption? No, they're not. I did not make scans of the diaries when I had them because there's like thousands and thousands of pages. So I I only had the messages and I uh, I have all the messages, all 139 messages, but I didn't, I don't have the original writing. I have them typed in with the decryptions along with them. So if, if anybody wants a, a full decryption, I have the blessings of the family to share that. So. All right. Excellent. Thank you. 